so much for that introduction, and thank you for inviting me to come. It's great, great to be here today. I hope to uh, inform you a little bit about the, this uh, project, uh, maybe inspire you to do something along related lines. I think the results that we have so far are just an inkling that it might be possible to do something. It might be possible to do things that would uh, help nudge people towards occasionally considering or exposing themselves to, uh, to challenging viewpoints. Uh, maybe there'll be a few entertaining things along the way, and at the end I'm going to ask for your advice about a couple of things, both uh, the next experiment that we're going to run, a few details of it, might as well pick your brains, uh, and uh, also since uh, we're here in Silicon Valley, I want to get any ideas you might have about um, business opportunities. Uh, <laughs> Can, is there somebody who will pay to get to uh, to uh, get people to have uh, diverse ex uh, diverse exposure to exposure to diverse political viewpoints? So the work that I'm going to talk about today is uh, several different pieces. Um, much of it, uh, or two of the pieces, uh, were uh, joint with. Sean Munson, uh, there were parts of his dissertation work uh, when he was a doctoral student with me at Michigan. He's now an assistant professor at Washington. Um, the last project I'm going to talk about is with Sunil Park, who was, um, he was a PhD student at KAIST in, in uh, Korea, and then a postdoc working with me. Now he's at, at Telefonica. And I've been influenced a lot uh, by Another former doctoral student who graduated some years ago now, he's an associate professor at Ohio State, uh, who's in the communications department and, and sort of went deeper into thinking about the, um, you know, what, is, what are the, uh, what do communication scholars and political scientists know about this arena? So a preview here, it's good for society if people who are liberal occasionally read stuff that is mostly read by conservatives. It's also good for society if people who are conservative in their viewpoint occasionally read things that are mostly read by liberals. And that maybe that's not happening quite as much as it as would be good for society. Although uh, it may not be as bad as some of the pundits are saying in terms of how polarized we are. Certainly, uh, there, it would be good if, if we had a little bit more exposure to challenge. And then, uh, I'm going to go through three efforts that we've made to try to nudge people, push them a little bit towards getting more exposure to, to challenging viewpoints. Uh, one of those is to simply reflect back to people, here's what you're, you've actually been exposed to. A second is to provide uh, a news aggregator that lists a bunch of articles for today, uh, where in one version of that, those articles are sorted and highlighted to make it easier for you to find the ones that you'll agree with or disagree with. And the third is uh, giving you a bunch of articles on one story, on one topic that come from different sources. And when we do that, is it better to, uh, to sort them by the, ideolo the ideology of the source, or is it better to just mix them up? So societal benefits of challenge exposure. There are, there are a few arguments for why this is going to be better for society. Um, one is that uh, people who are exposed to more viewpoints will be able to recite more of those viewpoints. They'll have a larger argument repertoire about what are the, what are the claims that some people are making on controversial issues, immigration reform, let's say. Uh, and that that increased argument repertoire will, A, lead to more tolerance uh, of people who disagree, and some moderation. If you sort of see the issue from multiple sides, it's a little bit harder to, to hold on to a really extreme viewpoint. Another claim is that uh, when we have, uh, when we have uh, people who think that they're in a majority, but they're not, they get really angry when policy decisions go against them. 
I, I think we should, we should end the death penalty. I think it's a really bad policy. Uh, it hasn't happened. I could think that there's a terrible conspiracy of people who are keeping that going. It actually turns out, though, that you look at the opinion polls, most people don't agree with me. And so I have to, when I understand that they don't agree with me, it makes me a little bit less likely to come up with a conspiracy theory for why my position isn't the law. So this is a, you know, another reason why we end up getting a little bit less um, fragmentation, a little bit less uh, uh, ripping apart of society if people understand when sometimes they're losing because actually they're in the minority. Now, uh, this, this idea that we may be uh, not getting enough exposure has gotten a lot of play. Um, in March of 2011, Ellie Pariser gave a TED talk as a way to start publicizing his book, The Filter Bubble. A quick poll here. How many of you have seen this TED talk or read his book or otherwise know of this filter bubble argument? Okay. So the, the bubble is a metaphor. The idea is that, uh, that uh, when you're inside the bubble, you only see certain kinds of things, and the things that are outside the bubble are, 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 not, uh, are not visible to you. And... Uh, so if you're inside the bubble, you'll only see the things that already agree with you, that you won't have serendipity, you won't have awareness of, of what's going on uh, for, for, for what other people are seeing. Now, there is some evidence that's out there about how polarized online news reading actually is. And it's, it's not, it is not as bad as, uh, as Pariser would, would make it out. So, for example, Gensko and Shapiro in their Quarterly Journal of Economics article, they they um, they class they scored sources, Fox News, New York Times, various blogs, um, by the percentage of the audience for those sources that identify themselves as conservative, conservative or liberal, and then if you look at the people who describe themselves as liberal or conservative and see what sources they're going to. Overall, there are more people, slightly more conservatives than liberals in this country. So 50% of the audience for publications overall is, is, uh, is uh, if you take a, sa a sample of everybody, you look at all the publications that they look at, those, those uh, publications have a 57% conservative audience. If you take just the liberals and see which things they're looking at, their audiences have 53% conservative. So there is a, a tilt, and the conservatives are going to sites that have 60%, 61% conservative audience. So there is a difference, and and they, they quantify this difference between the, these uh, sources that the liberals and conservatives are seeing, uh, and then they try to compare it to some other places where there might be polarization, like uh, what newspapers, uh, print newspapers people are looking at, or even some measures of face-to-face -face ideological se segregation. Yeah? Just because it seems interesting, it seems symmetric. Um, that is, neither side seems to be listening more to just their side than the other ones, at least by, this, by these numbers. Not obviously from this, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, of course, we all think that our side's actually pretty good about checking the other side, but the other side is never is just staying in their bubble. Um, the, the other really interesting point they found is that the real divide is between people who uh, follow political news and people who don't. So the average um, Yahoo News reader is less likely to, re to also read the New York Times than the average reader of a far-right blog. So the people who are reading Breitbart, they're also looking at the New York Times more often than people who read Yahoo News. Uh, so. These are, these are some stories that say, yeah, there, is, there are some differences. Maybe it's not quite as, as scary as, as, um, as Pariser would make it out. But Pariser is also arguing 
something about uh, trends, and that the better our tools get, the more we're likely to, to end up in these bubbles. Now, these concerns are not new. In fact, this group lens paper that Michael was referring to, the, the one that was presented at CSCW in 1994, one of our little paragraphs was, okay, you know, if we, re if we had lots of recommender systems, will there be a problem that we'll all be getting the stuff that we like and, and we'll split into, the global village will split into these tribes? Our conclusion was that actually it, it might not be so bad because you might split into tribes, but there might be a lot of cross-fertilization. What's that? 1994. And what this, this question was coming up before this, right? Because when Negroponte was proposing his stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> and Negroponte was talking, I think, I think it, Negroponte is a little bit later. I, I don't remember. That. What, what's the year of this being digital? Okay, so, so, 90, so 91, so maybe that's why we were inspired. I don't remember why we thought of it. It ended up being those you know, two paragraphs in the paper. But so Negroponte is talking about the daily me and that we can have these personalized digital newspapers. He was, he, this is 95, okay, but he was writing about it and talking about it certainly for a few years before. So anyway, th these things were in the air, the idea that we were gonna have personalization and the concerns that maybe with personalization something bad was gonna happen. Fracturing of the global village or um, no serendipity. Uh, and so, you know, Negroponte's idea was you're gonna have a little dial that says, uh, only personalize this much. Give me some stuff that, that, uh, that'll come from, from everybody else. Cass Sunstein, and this is, oh, I should have put years on, on these things, but uh, this is, I think, around 2000. Uh, he's, he's writing uh, republic.com saying, uh, this is, this is going to be really bad. People online, people are going to be able to get what they want, and what they want is only stuff that they already agree with. In the era of Newspapers, they couldn't just get what they want. And so everything was okay. But now people are going to be able to get what they want and it's, it's going to be horrible. So I'm, I'm arguing that this is not new with Pariser, but, um, but there is a different response. There's much more public resonance. This is the, these are the reviews about Cass Sunstein's book. Uh, this, I got, took these a couple of years ago. Um, a couple of people liked it. But there's a whole lot of one-star things, and they say, not the internet I know, or uh, he's an authoritarian trying to interfere with, with free speech. Um, this is the response to, uh, to Ellie Pariser. A lot more favorable here. Uh, 479, this is, this is now old statistics, but you know, almost half a million views for his for his video, it got mostly positive review in the New York Times, a separate contributed op-ed article, uh, rave reviews on Amazon. Thank God the internet is hide isn't hiding the filter bubble from me. An absolute must read for anyone who uses the internet left or right. Shrewd, thoughtful, and well-executed insight into the downside of internet personalization. Uh, by the way, Sergey Brin and Larry Page's talk, about half as many views. Um, <laughs> Yeah, not everybody who, who watched the video reviewed the book. Um, so he's, he's got, he's even has a little new, new parlor game compa of comparing search engine results. Have any of you tried doing this to see how personalized your results are? So he says, um, in the spring of 2010, while the remains of the Deepwater Horizon oil rig were spewing crude oil into the Gulf of Mexico, I asked two friends to search for the term BP. They're pretty similar, educated, white, left-leaning women who live in the Northeast, but the results they saw were quite different. One of my friends saw investment information about BP, the other saw news. For one, the first page of results contained links about the oil spill. For the other, there was nothing about it except for a promotional ad for BP. So that's his, um, that's his concern. And uh, have any of you tr tried doing this? So you, you, you can, you'll, you'll get different results. Uh, I'll get results that are from University of Michigan and you'll get results from Stanford. And I'll think, wow, you know, University of Michigan is doing really well in the, in the, in the scholarly community. Every, everything's linking to us. And you guys think that Stanford's doing really well. Everything's linking to you. There's actually a, a, a research project at the Brown Institute at Columbia that I was trying to 
quantify the knobs to look at how your Google results are different based on you know your race or age or where you're coming from since that's not really exposed to us. So since you're right. doing search engine that lets you kind of change those parameters. Changing based on the parameters. Yeah, and there's, there's going to be this uh, interesting workshop at ICWSM this year on sort of auditing algorithms, sort of taking the, the classic sort of auditing studies where they try to see whether, uh, you know, auditing studies in social science have been things like uh, sending resumes for jobs uh, with, that are identical except one has an ethnic name and the other doesn't and see you know, how, how likely are you to, to get a job, a, a callback for, for the job. So this is trying to do sort of the equivalent for algorithms, and, and that, that, that study is, is you know, doing it for search engines, but there are all kinds of algorithms where we might like to see, on average, do they perform differently for women or men, or do they perform differently for, for people in this country or another country. So there's enough resonance that you, know, you can go to DuckDuckGo, and they, their whole advertising as a search engine is, we don't bubble you or, or track you. We'll give you non-personalized results. Okay, and they have a little cartoon story. Uh, well, okay. You want to see it? So escape your search engine filter bubble. I've, I've given part of it. Is look at the horrible thing that happens if you go to Bing. One person gets one thing. Somebody else gets, gets something else. But... Uh, if you, if you go search for Barack Obama, then Ann gets MSNBC and Elaine gets Fox News, but that won't happen if you come and use our search engine. So there's a lot of resonance, a lot of concern that this is, that this is a problem. And of course, um, this personalized filtering isn't just when you search, it's also just when you use your, your Facebook news feed. They don't, they don't uh, tell us exactly how they're doing it, but they're taking into account which things you click on. And Ellie Pariser has, uh, you know, has a nice story of, uh, he says he tries to, you know, he's, he's very liberal, but he, he was one of the founders of Move On. He, he says he tries to cultivate having some conservative friends, but he sort of can't help himself. He's more likely to actually click on the things that, that come from his liberal friends. And somehow Facebook has now decided that they're just going to hide all of the stuff that's posted by his conservative friends. All right. So what do we know? Um, in the social science literature about what people really want. Do they want just to get uh, stuff that already agrees with them? And uh, there's one theory that says, uh, yes, uh, they, they want to get things that reinforce what they already know. And one explanation for this is a confirmation bias that it's not just in news. Whatever you happen to know, you're likely to go out seeking information that will uh, confirm that you're right, rather than go out and seeking information that will make you change your mind. Uh, there's also a theory that people are deliberately trying to avoid things that will make them feel bad, like things that tell them what you thought isn't right. Uh, and this goes back to a theory of, of cognitive dissonance of, uh, of Festinger and uh, that that uh, people don't like this feeling of cognitive dissonance, and they'll try to they'll try to take actions to avoid it. However, there is some uh, there is some evidence that people, in some circumstances, do uh, are open to challenge. One is when they just need to know whether they need to know what's true. They need to know whether what they were what they were previously thinking is right. They're about to go to. Uh, they're about to go to Thanksgiving dinner, and they know they're going to have to defend their opinion with their in-laws, who uh, who are who have different opinions. So they figure they better get a few a few bits of information on their side. There are also uh, people are open to challenge when they're when they're feeling secure. So uh, it, it's okay. I, I can handle a little bit of challenge now because it's not it's it's not it's not so threatening, and. Uh, when they're feeling like it's not an either or. I can have stuff that will, that will agree with me and I'll get some stuff that, that doesn't agree with me. Uh, and so remember that idea because that's gonna be the, the seed for one of our intervention ideas that we think maybe uh, getting people to, to consider other opinions in the context 
where they also have easy access to opinions that they agree with may be, may be one strategy. There's also, uh, while we may have some behaviors that we exhibit, that we look at a bunch of things in our newsfeed and don't click on the stuff that seems like it's going to be offensive to us, um, we may still believe that we ought to. There is a societal norm that we should be balanced. And that may be something that we can appeal to. When people make explicit decisions, deciding about what their future information diet is going to be, they may, they may be influenced to choose consistently with this norm, even though in the moment they don't. So remember that idea too, because that's going to be the, in fact, that's going to be the seed for, for this first for this first idea. So I'm now going to talk about three, three uh, ways to try to nudge people. The first one is just to give people some feedback. So if we think that they have, that they're following this, or they believe in this norm of balanced exposure, but in the minute to minute, they're not following their long-term desires, then maybe giving them some feedback about what they're actually doing will help them to r remind them to, to do what they wanted, what they wanted to do in the long term. So we give them some feedback and we do it in, in a way that um, sort of reminds people of the norm. So balanced is good, unbalanced is bad. Uh, we made a browser extension and you can see up in this, in the upper right hand corner, there's a little icon uh, and that's our balance man. And when you click on it, you get to see him. Um, unbalanced is bad. You're going to fall off the tightrope and die. <laughs> and then we have a few others getting to more balanced. You're very happy. Everything's good. And if you're, of course, unbalanced the other way, you're again, you're unhappy because you're going to die. OK. So we have these 11 cartoon figures. And we show you one of these figures depending on what your history has been. So how do we determine which of these 11 figures? Well, we have a, a coding of all of the sources, or many sources. Uh, we've got a number to assign to the New York Times, and another one to decide to think progress, and another one to assign to Slate. We get those. There, there are three sources um, for our list of, of sites. One is that against Callum Shapiro article, and another is from a site that was up for a while called Mimi Random Colors. Another is from a paper that, that we wrote where we were, we uh, used a semi-supervised learning technique where we had dig votes, and we had a few people that we knew what their, what their, um, what their uh, liberal conservative position was, and we had a, a, a few hundred articles that we hand coded, or we had mechanical turkers hand code, and, and then we propagate and, and we get a, uh, a coding for, for the rest of things. So all three of those lists give us sort of left right score for each of the sources. Yes? Um, so I guess the dig votes were more partisan than what people read. You just told us a figure a second ago saying that actually people read, read both articles, but they aren't necessarily up for both articles. Uh, we, we definitely found there, there, was, there was a lot of signal in the, uh, in the dig votes. Uh, if, we, if we knew that you were from a group that was, uh, you know, act, especially because the, the people that we knew of uh, were people who had joined groups that labeled themselves on dig as, 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 as liberal or conservative, and even some of the traffic on those groups was things about, let's go upvote this article together so that we can uh, ma make this... Uh, get this exposed to more people. Yeah. Uh, this is, I guess, a simplifying assumption that everything falls in this linear spectrum of liberal and conservative. Uh, does this work well in practice, or uh, is re reducing dimensionality problematic in itself? Right. So we are reducing things to a single dimension here. And obviously, that doesn't capture the whole world. It doesn't capture people, and it doesn't capture articles or, or sources perfectly. But it is, but it, it's correlated enough so that you can see trends, uh, and uh, and it is it is the same dimension that people are used to seeing, whenever there are pundits on TV and and things like that. So when you ask people, 
where do you stand? Some people will say, you know, I'm an independent and you can't classify me. Uh, and, but, but many people will say, no, I, I'm a liberal, I'm, I'm a conservative. And this only works for, this only works for the people who, uh, who fit somewhere on this one dimension in a neat way. And it doesn't, it won't tell us very much about the people who, you know, are all over the place on different issues. All right, so we have that, that coding of the sites. Uh, we got people to install this browser extension. Uh, and then the extension is able to capture their history for 30 days before they install the browser extension. We asked them a bunch of questions, including what's your political leaning? Uh, and then we randomized them to a treatment or a control condition. The, uh, the treatment condition is that they got to see the feedback and the control was that they got nothing. I'm not sure what happened to my, uh, I lost my illustration of what the, uh, the treatment and control look like, but the, the treatment you've seen and the control, instead of showing you whether you're falling off one way or the other or, or happily balanced, it just says how many days until we're gonna give you the feedback. So it's a little countdown timer, 28 days, 27 days, 26 days. The reason, the reason we need to do a control condition, even though we're comparing before installation to after, is that we need to do a difference in difference. Anybody who signs up for this is gonna have some effect from being in a study and having thought about it and signing up. So we do see an effect of everybody from their history to afterwards, and we have to compare what's the difference in, in, in that change uh, between the people who get the feedback and the people who don't get the feedback. All right, so we recruited subjects for a couple months. Uh, Word of mouth, it's in the Google extension directory. Uh, a lot of it was, was from some media mentions in, in tech blogs. Uh, we got a bunch of people to install it, 1145. 990 of them completed the survey. So those are the people who, who were, were using. Uh, they were liberal. Uh, and, and you'll see we, we've divided up in the results that we have uh, we get statistically significant results for the liberals. We don't get statistically significant results for the conservatives, even though it looks like a, a larger effect because we just don't have enough of them. Uh, so they, they are, four would be neutral, and they're leaning you know, more than a point on average towards the liberal side. Uh, they're also 80% um, uh, male and uh, age not, not so badly skewed. but. So there's some, some issues of representativeness of the sample. It's a convenient sample. It's people who, who thought they wanted, people who agreed with this norm, people who thought they wanted to be nudged. And the question is, even for them, does it, does it work to nudge them? So we compute their, their, uh, their balance score. This is the, uh, the average score of all the, all the sites they visit. And we, we made this on a 1 to 11 scale because we had 11 pictures. Uh, and right in the middle, six was the perfectly happy, balanced guy. Uh, and then we, uh, just so that it's easy to, to think about this uh, for both liberals and conservatives, if you were a liberal and you mostly were reading liberal stuff, you end up with a positive score. And if you're conservative on this RA measure, we're just normalizing it to, to which side you are. Uh, if you're conservative and you're mostly reading conservative stuff, you get a, a positive score on this RA measure. Two hands were up here. Yeah, I was wondering how uh, you sort of um, put this in context with some of the social psych literature, like Jonathan Haidt's stuff with the pillars of morality and how, you know, liberals on the whole are more open to, you know, new experiences and stuff like that, whereas conservatives prefer, you know, comfort and, and things they're familiar with and so forth. Because that kind of might explain that skew and also, you know, might, uh, like, would you know, based on that research, there's a question of are conservatives sort of even interested in something like this or even interested in, in being nudged if it's, you know, some, not something that they value or not something that they identify with or things like that. Yeah, so uh, there are some theories out there that say liberals are, are more, uh, more likely to expose themselves to challenging things because they have, they value openness and that's, openness is not something that's especially valued uh, for conservatives. So that might give you, uh, you know, 
some priors, a, a theory about how you think this might come out. You might also use that to say, well, that's, that would tell you who would sign up for this. I would not take our sign up data as evidence for that hypothesis um, because I think the, the places where it was advertised are also liberal skewed. Uh, so it, it may just be, you know, who heard about it and not who was interested. It, I'm not saying it's not true. I just say I don't think I have any evidence for it, even though even though we have more liberals signing up. I was just going to ask about where it was advertised or what the the selection. The the process. thing that gave us the, the big jump was uh, was when when some some tech news sources wrote about it, and then then we saw a whole lot of people sign up. So that's my interpretation is that was a big source for us. Okay, so here are the, um, here's the, what did people, uh, what were people's scores be in the month before they signed up? So this is where we're using the history. And uh, zero would be, they were perfectly balanced. And uh, the y-axis is the number of our subjects who are in each of these categories. So this is the number of people who were about one, you know, a half to one and a half. Skewed, uh, skewed towards the stuff that was agreeable, one and a half to two and a half, and so on. So people were skewed towards their side. Uh, actually, the liberals were skewed towards their side. We'll see in a minute what the, where the conservatives were. Just a, uh, a question about your data. Of the news sources, sort of what's the distribution on that 1 to 11 scale? Were they all clumped near the middle? Were they? That's a good question, and I don't know. I, see. I, would, I should know, and I just I don't have that. Okay. Sorry. I would be a helpful thing to have. Uh, here's the conservatives. Uh, I've just flipped it downwards. We also just have fewer of them. You can see that there's a you know, maximum of 60. Of our conservatives who signed up, yeah, there are more who are, who are reading more conservative stuff than we're reading more liberal stuff. But actually, they're less skewed than, than our liberals. So Maybe the, the, the only, maybe the only conservatives who sign up are those who actually are fair and balanced. I, I don't know. Um, so this is, the, this is what we get for the results at the end. This is the delta of your post to your pre. And if we have a, uh, a negative, it means they're reading more, co more conservative stuff at the end than at the beginning. And if we have a Above zero, it means they're reading more liberal stuff at the end than at the beginning. And uh, these are the people I've divided into control and treatment. The treatment, it doesn't look so obviously uh, different here, but it is, uh, there is a difference between these. And in a minute, I'll give you a substantive interpretation of what these numbers mean. And it, and it turns out it is also statistically significantly different. For the, uh, for the, for the people who, had too much conservative stuff at the beginning and needed more liberal stuff in order to be balanced, we see uh, an even bigger difference. Uh, but the difference between these two, there's fewer of the people, so the, this is not statistically significantly different. There was another question over here. Yeah, I, I don't know if this is the right time to ask it, but um, I wonder, like, not all news sources or news articles that people are reading are equal, right? And so I'm wondering if. For example, so I'm just going to use my own bias as a liberal here. Um, <coughs> if I were interested in this, but most of the conservative sources I were seeing were sort of anti-vaccine, anti-science, anti-evolution and stuff, I could imagine that that pushes me further towards being liberal rather than if I read things less crazy um, on the conservative side. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm curious whether that sort of factored into things where, you know, even the New York Times has been grappling with this where if politicians say things that are obviously false, should they be calling them out on it versus, you know, uh, or just reporting sort of the, from a neutral standpoint and things like that? Um, yeah, so there's, there's all kinds of stuff that are abstracted away into these. This source is a 1.3. Yeah. And, and also, in my, the sort of the outcome that I'm looking at is more exposure more diverse exposure. I don't know anything about how people are interpreting what they see. Are they looking at this stuff so they can ridicule it? And, and would that be bad? I mean, part, part, of the, part of the arguments about 
about why diverse exposure is, is valuable, say it's okay if people are looking at it in order to ridicule it. They're still aware that there's somebody who, who, has, who has that opinion. Now, it, there's also stuff going on where, where uh, there's really ridiculous stuff by conservatives that liberals love to look at that none of the conservatives are looking at because we love to see how dumb they are. Right? And, and uh, so there's all kinds of stuff that's, that's getting lost in this. And, uh, but I think we get, the, we, we get the overall effect. And the big thing that I wanted to see is if, if uh, people think that they should be uh, uh, more balanced, and therefore they sign up for this thing, or at least they're just curious about how balanced they are, does the feedback move them? And it does move them modestly to give you a sense. Oh, so there's the statistical significance. Um, to give you a sense of, of how, how much that is, uh, that, that the median difference, or the, that mean difference for the median liberal reading user, and the me median liberal leaning user had 187 visits over the course of that, of that month to news sites. Uh, for them, that whatever 0.13 difference would be four new visits to a Think Progress, Breitbart, Drudge Report kind of place, or 20 new visits to a, to a neutral site. So if they were you know, reading Huffington Post, then if they read 20 more neutral things, that would also bring the, the average in. So this is you know, on 187 visits, having four visits to the, to the right or 20 extra neutral, I think that's actually a fairly large difference. Uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not negligible. Uh, my conclusion is that, yeah, it, it works a bit. James? Do we know if these um, participants are, um, first of all, someone who is likely to install this particularly more active in reading views? Because just that. That's you know kind of like six visits per day or something seem kind of high to me on average. So where are these news junkies kind of um, that you were? I, I don't know what the Comscore average user is. We, we don't know a lot about these people other than the, the survey we ask them and the behavior that we have. And the survey asks them, you know, their age and their their gender and their politics. And the behavior we have is, is which news sites they're looking at. So yeah, this does look like a lot to me. And it also makes sense if you advertise, we have something that monitors your news reading behavior and you don't read news at all. You're like, <laughs> I'm not going to install that. Yeah. Uh, is there a dosage effect in the sense that is, does this work equally well regardless of how liberal you are? Or if, if I'm very strongly liberal, do I have a much greater shift? After installing this, because that guy is falling down. Right, right. right. I, I don't know. Uh, my guess is we don't have enough data to to break it down that way. But uh, it would be worth taking a look and and at least seeing what maybe something jumps out at us. So I want to uh, go on and talk about a, a couple more. Uh, so that's one that seems like I, I think is somewhat promising. Feedback. People respond to feedback. Some people, some people respond to feedback. I don't think this is the be all and end all, but it, it's, it says, yeah, if we care about this, this is one thing that's worth pushing on some more. Second idea that we explored, and, and this is going to be a less happy ending, just so you're, just so you're aware, aware of what's coming, um, is that we made a news aggregator where uh, we we're going to ask, we we're going to give people a set of news articles every day. and we're going to ask them how they like it. And different days, different, if you come back multiple days, you'll, you'll get a different mix of, of uh, liberal and conservative stuff. We're deliberately varying how, how much. And we're seeing, you know, does, does, does a 50-50 mix versus an 80-20 mix, how does that affect your satisfaction? And we're trying to see whether telling you, hey, these is, this is the stuff we, you'll agree with, the yellow stuff, or not telling you, does that, does that make a difference in your satisfaction? 
especially your satisfaction with the, the mixes that have more challenging items. So we recruited people by Mechanical Turk. We did some qualification tasks and quality control. I'm not going to go through details here because I see I'm running way short on time. Uh, if they don't tell us their politics or if, if they say they're a liberal Republican or a conservative Democrat, we throw them out because we don't know what to do with them. But if they're, <laughs> but if they're, if they're consistent on those two, then, then we include them. Uh, and then they can come multiple days. Each day, uh, Sean was getting up each morning and, and checking what the news was and, and making our aggregator. People were all over the United States. Um, and we had, uh, all right, so the articles that we're getting is uh, mostly automated. So we're, we're, we had uh, 500 bl political blogs and he was seeing what they were linking to automatically. Um, but then, uh, then we did some filtering. If you had an article that liberal and conservative blogs were both linking to in equal amounts, we didn't use that. We only used the ones where there was an imbalance mostly liberals or mostly conservative blogs are, are linking to it. And we also got rid of Wikipedia articles and some other stuff. Um, so we end up with about 23 items, 23 liberal and 23 conservative items each day. Some of the people get their mixture of, of, of articles uh, just unlabeled and unsorted. Some of them get them labeled with uh, the yellow highlight for stuff that is agreeable to you, and some of them get all the agreeable stuff first and highlighted. Just to give a sense of, you know, here's what it looked like when it wasn't just a thumbnail. You would get uh, a title and a, and a little snippet for each of the articles. And at the end, we're asking you, how satisfied are you with the stuff you got? So our outcome is going to be how satisfied they are. That's what's on my y-axis. The x-axis is what percentage of the items that we gave you that day were agreeable. And so, as you might expect, and actually we're only taking, we've filtered out, there are some people who actually liked getting a mix. They said they liked getting a mix and they, we, we looked at their data. Sure enough, they were happier when they were getting a mix. We're, we're sort of filtering those people out and then we're, we're, we're looking at, at, at the people who liked it better when there was more agreeable items. And uh, did the highlighting help? No. Uh, it seemed to actually amplify their, pre their preference. So they like the all agreeable stuff even more when they can, when, when they can tell. Uh, and they, they like the all disagreeable stuff even less when they can tell. When they're not forewarned, about exactly where these things are coming from, they're a little bit more muted in their preferences. So not successful there. And uh, if we do the highlighting and the sorting, uh, it's even worse. They're just less satisfied all the time. Except, except, when, they, except when they're getting all agreeable stuff and then, then it's okay. Um, but okay, so this, this manipulation at least the day that we have the particular implementation, not successful. I'm not ready to say, don't ever try this. Uh, but I'm also not saying you definitely should, because we don't have good evidence for it. Uh, all those, those claims of, of the slopes being different or the intercept being different hold up in the statistical analysis as well. OK, third. Third uh, idea is to take, is, is similar to that, except instead of sorting and highlighting, we're now going to sort and put boxes around things that are all the uh, alt-conservative and all the mainstream conservative and all the mainstream liberal things. They're each going to go in their own box. And we're going to do that not for all the news of today, but all the news about one topic. So if you're reading one topic, this makes it easy to find other things on the same topic. So we actually prototype this, although we haven't released this as in, in the wild yet. The idea is that you're, um, you're using 
uh, your browser and you're reading a news story and you can pop up recommendations for other news on the same topic. And those things will be grouped into, into clusters, clusters one, two, three, and four here. Uh, this is work with uh, Siddharth Chabra and, and Sunil Park. So Sunil had done this, done an experiment with uh, Korean news uh, where he took all the articles about one topic and then clustered them by subtopics. So what words are being used in, in one set of stories versus another, which might capture some ideological differences, but might not, might capture other things. Uh, he found that when they presented the, the set of other articles on the current topic, just in a random order, the sort of Google News style, people read fewer articles and they got fewer aspects, fewer topical aspects of the, of the story. So instead of four articles per topic, they were getting 2.56. And he thinks and it's good evidence for the fact that it's, it's the, um, it's the sorting by subtopic that makes the difference, not the having boxes. Because if we just have boxes and randomly put things into the different clusters, that doesn't make people read more articles. So we get the 2.68 and 2.56 are basically the same. What makes people read more articles is if the clusters are meaningful. So we wanted to take this idea and say, what happens if we do it with political clustering instead of topical clustering? So you're reading, this is, you know, a year and a half ago, but uh, McCain was not happy with Janet Yellen for the Federal Reserve. And so uh, this is an article in NBC criticizing that case. Uh, that's coming from sort of a mainstream liberal publication. Cluster one is the alt-liberal Huffington Post Think Progress. Uh, cluster three is the Washington Times and Fox News, sort of mainstream conservative. And then you've got Breitbart and Blaze in cluster four. So you see one article and you say, oh, I wonder what some other people from some other perspective are saying about McCain and Yellen. And you can, you can see it. We wanted to see what the effect of this would be versus just having those same stories not grouped by ideology. How many of you think, well, I already told you what's gonna, how it's going to come out, so I'm not going to ask you. But there, but there are competing predictions here for what should happen from the social science literature. I think if you just take the, the, this whole selective exposure literature, saying that people are averse to challenge and they have, you know, they, the reinforcement bias and so on, uh, that they should be less likely to sample from both sides, from a liberal and a conservative source, if they can tell that that's what they're getting. Make it easier for people to stay with the, stay with the amenable stuff and they will. Or you might think that they would be more likely to sample from both sides. Of course, we have the, the analogy to the, to the News Cube study that made us suspect that and that's why we're trying it. Uh, but there are also some, some substantive reasons that you might, that you might come up with. Um, Maybe people actually want to find new perspectives and this makes it easier to find those. Uh, the fact that, that this is in the context where they've already had, have easy access to things that will reinforce their opinions. If I come across something that's really challenging, I can at least retreat and find out, you know, find out why that was wrong and, and, and someone will be able to buttress my, my, uh, my values. Uh, I think also the clusters may be making the diversity norm more salient. When you see them clustered like that, you say, oh yeah, I guess I really am supposed to sample from more than one. So those are possible reasons why you might get, get more. So our experiment design here, this is a simple A-B test. We're going to randomly assign some people to get the clustered recommendations, some people to just get in random order. The outcomes, uh, and this is sort of on each story, like. McCain and Yellen, uh, the number of articles the person reads, the number of different viewpoint clusters they sample from, and especially are they reading from at least, are they reading at least one liberal and one conservative article? 
So they actually start, they have a, they have a sort of a, a landing page where they can pick news stories that they're interested in. So McCain was one of them, or Fox News is freaking out about Oprah and race issues. Uh, Obamacare forced my mom into Medicaid. So um, these are the, we're trying to give the participants some choice. They get to read about some story that's of interest to them. And when they're tired of reading about that story, they know that they can go on and read something else. They don't have to keep reading articles on the same topic. Uh, and again, we recruit subjects from Mechanical Turk, some not quite uh, even uh, distribution in our randomization. Uh, we do get people reading more articles when it's clustered. Just ask to do the task without understanding the, the uh, I don't remember the exact wording of the of what the head says, but it's basically um, test our news or our news recommender, uh, read news for a couple of minutes, and and it said uh, it said uh, you'll you have to read news for five minutes. You pick which stories you want to read, uh, and then there was a countdown timer. They couldn't they couldn't they couldn't quit before five minutes was up, but they could leave. McCain Yellen and go talk about uh, Nicole Hopkins and or read about Nicole Hopkins instead. So the, we're trying to make it so they don't have to, to to keep exploring a story beyond what they're interested in. And they each person only gets one version or the other. So they're hopefully well. We'll we'll talk about some some of these limitations. So they're reading more stories uh, or more articles. They are. Uh, they are sampling from more clusters, and uh, they're much more likely to read both a liberal and a conservative article when we have when we have it clustered. So here's the sort of counts. We have uh, these are the people who only read a liberal story. These are the people who uh, sorry a liberal article on the on the current story. These are people who only read a conservative article. And uh, these are people who read both a liberal and a conservative article. Yeah? Preference, for example, more commonly just to read whatever articles are up in the upper left corner of the page? Yes. And I'll talk about that was a mistake in our, in our design. Uh, well, in our case, upper right corner. But uh, yeah, um, we didn't counterbalance the order. And that's, that's one of the questions I'm going to be asking for your advice on, how, how much counterbalancing we should do. Uh, so people are, people are reading first from the non-mainstream liberal, which was the top group. So this is, this is the first article they look at. And most people are looking at the non-mainstream liberal article first. Some people are reading a, a mainstream liberal article. That was the second cluster. A few people are reading a mainstream conservative, and not very many people are going all the way down to the, the fourth cluster. But here's the second article that they look at. And you can see there's, uh, uh, this is the unclustered interface. There are some, um, yeah, there's, there are some people who, uh, who, after they read one article from non-mainstream liberal, are going to read something else. And I've sort of used a darker font when people are sort of switching sides from the current article, not a darker font, but a darker shade, um, when they're switching from one to the next. And there's some people who are switching. This is the unclustered interface. But with the clustered interface, there's a lot more people who are switching sides. So we have a similar distribution for the first thing that they look at. But the second thing they look at, much, much more likely to be from a conservative source when it's clustered. So I take this as sort of a positive sign, but it really would be interesting, well, what if they didn't always choose a liberal thing first, if we, maybe if we reverse the order. So let me talk about those limitations. So there, there are issues of representativeness and quality control with, with Mechanical Turk. Uh, there's the ordering of the clusters. We always had alt-liberal at the top and alt-conservative at the bottom. Uh, 
what were the subjects really thinking when they did this? This was uh, somebody asked the question of, uh, you know, what what were the instructions? And uh, we had a reviewer who raised the question: well, Maybe people thought that you were testing that this was a test of the interface and not of the news recommendations, and so they clicked on all the things that there were to click on in the interface. It might be possible. There's more things to click on when there's more boxes, so. I should click on more boxes if I think this is an interface test, which I think is possible. There's also the external validity. People are coming to this, they're looking at it, they're reading one story, it's not part of, maybe they, maybe they never read news at all, or it's not part of how they usually read news. So we have plans for a follow-on study for this to, to uh, try to satisfy our reviewers and ourselves that, uh, that this result really is robust. So we, we want to try to this both as a Mechanical Turk study and as a lab study. Do a little bit better quality check at the end, like tell us what the story was. Make sure that they weren't just letting the timer run down for five minutes. Um, and then uh, randomize the order of clusters. Well, I'm going to ask you in a minute how much, how random we should make it. Um, some small interface changes to not suggest interface exploration and, and sort of a careful fine tooth comb over the instructions. For the external validity, eventually when we want to put out this browser extension so that we let people use it in their natural setting, the problem there is you have to actually make good suggestions of other articles. And it's doable, but we, have, we haven't yet gotten to something that we're ready to, to put out in the wild for that. So here are the questions that I, I want to ask you. We can just have two possible orders, liberal to conservative and conservative to liberal, or we could try all permutations. From an experimental design standpoint, you, you might think it would be better to try all the permutations. Uh, but from a user standpoint, we think of things along this liberal to conservative dimension. And so what do you think here? Just one step higher. I mean, it seemed like you're almost testing two different interfaces. The first was a recommendation one where I might go and see how many things match interest. And the second is a clustering interface. I mean. Uh, the, two, the two things are both recommending the same set of articles. But in the first one, it's being presented as a single list like Google. And in the second one, it's, I'm testing the value of the clustering. So, you're, so you're, we're talking about this versus the other. And you think? So I would view the first one like, oh, these are Google results that relate to you know, this thing. Not Google, but I mean. I would look through and see, same way I do on the first page of Google, which ones are relevant to me. Yeah. So I'd probably be more likely to just pick out the ones that are relevant. Whereas in the second one, they're being presented as explicit clusters. And so you've asked me to evaluate this interface, and so I'm going to evaluate it as a clustering interface. So I want to look for diversity. Right. So this is, this is the argument that... Well, I'm saying that you were asking this question about how to present the cluster. That was like, that seems like a much more fundamental issue. Well, but if, if we... So we have to convince people that the task is not to evaluate the interface. The task is to evaluate the recommendation, the, what, read whatever you want. Find the things that you want to read. What's that? Randomly cluster the other ones. Well, we could also include, we could include the, uh, yeah. like he did in the original study, include a, a random assignment to clusters version. Yeah, that, 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 that might alleviate that concern. Yeah, James? The, the two problems with the methodology, and I don't know what the right solution for me, is the effects of positioning and all kinds of at least Western bias of how you'll go read. And so if that's not counterbalanced in some way, you're going to get some effect there. That's the one issue. And then the other issue I have is the one about you were looking at how do you make sure they read it. I'm being paid just to go into this thing. And, and that's going to be really impact. A lot of people are not necessarily going to do the task of actually reading. And so the question is, the results being anything if they're just clicking on links to get paid. And, One thing I've and seen that's a that's a methodology issue with some of these mechanical turn tasks, depending on what you're trying to measure. So one approach I've seen to that kind of a scenario is that upfront you're told that you're going to need to like write an essay arguing the point or like debate someone at the conclusion of this. So there's now there's no like go read. It's sort of like you're gonna debate this point. Here's the information you've got uh, five minutes ago. 
Right, that one wouldn't work for us because there's theory that says when people think that they're going to have to defend their viewpoint, they're much more likely to, to expose themselves to challenging things. So we don't want to, we, we don't want to make it artificial in that sense. Uh, we don't want to know just, just in those cases whether the clustering has, has the effect. But, but, but I mean, I, what I was thinking is we just tell them you're going to be asked, you're, you're going to have to, to say what the story was about. So we, if, they can't, if they can't say it was about McCain and Yellen and the Federal Reserve, then, then uh, well, I think we can just ask them at the end. And if they fail that, we throw them out. Yeah, we can just, yeah, then we throw them out if they, if they don't meet that quality check. So uh, this isn't what you asked, but I think, I think there's an important distinction between someone reading something and uh, someone reading something and thinking differently, having read it. And so I'm curious if we can get to the second part, which really seems to be the goal. Right? So, uh, and I wonder if what you want is sort of a dilemma question at the end, where you have to split some amount of money or something like that. If someone who has an opposing view than you do, mm -hmm. you can see if this split better or worse when, when you give these clusters to them. Yeah. I mean, we, we could try to go to some outcome that is, you know, have you changed your mind or do you, can you, there are things, for example, you know, can you, re, what, how big an argument repertoire can you recite? Um, but, but this is a test of what, are we able to change what people look at? It's not, a, it isn't a test of does it change people's mind. So if we can't change what they look at, then, you know, if we can't even get them to look at the other side, then, I, I'm, I don't think we're going to also get them to, to uh, consider the other side. So this is a, it, you know, it's, a, it's an intermediate step to, to where you'd like to get to. Okay, I, I, I will see by what you're saying. It, yeah. it's just a, if I'm aware that there are other points of view, even yeah. if I don't read those articles, then I might have a more encompassing view. Than right. So it could be that just showing the other points of view is all, you know, they, don't have, they don't have to click through. Yeah. Oh, your, thank your you. question. Um, and my answer... I got answers to other questions, which is, which is also good. <laughs> my answer will be along the lines of what I think most reflects the two choices that we have on the internet as it is. I think, so for a cluster naming, I think you should name them in terms of like liberal conservative law. Because over time, people are going to realize that's what the clusters are. When I pick up the New York Times, I know this is the mainstream liberal cluster. And when I pick up the Wall Street Journal, you know, so like over time, even if you don't label like in the long run, that'll be what it is. And if people pick only from the pile, the cluster that they, you know, already belong to, then that's telling you, you know, essentially, I, I feel like your, the results that you have would, would stand. Um, and I, uh, if, if, if you did that. I mean, presenting it differently as like, oh, here's the liberal slant, here's the conservative slant. People who want to have that curiosity satisfied of what other people will think, which I think is natural in many of us, and I don't ever get to it just because it isn't presented to me. You know, once it's, it's work for you. presented, will uh, it, it at least enable you to do that. And the opposite of that is like just the long Google list of random stuff that people kind of read until they're bored and don't get a a view of that sampling. So that's my instinct is also to, to, to name them. My only problem is that I, then I can't do the, 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 um, the random clusters, the random assignment to clusters, because that only works if the clusters aren't I named. Don't, I personally don't think you need to. You don't think I need that? that. I, All right. Good. I hope we get you as a reviewer. Um, so I, I think preferable to cluster one, two, three would be to just have no naming label and just have a graphic design element which shows that they're grouped. Okay. So yeah. So that's that that might be how we could a little bit less. We might we might preserve yeah, so we might we might preserve the uh, ability to do the the uh, random assignment that way. Yeah. Or I would add a tag um, just like a design tag just next to any every link that is, say this is mainstream liberal and then randomize the links uh, on every refresh and see what is the behavior if if I tend to agree with conservative content and when I find the first link to be conservative and I click versus if I find it liberal and I don't click. Uh -huh. So we could go back to the sort of the, the, uh, the labeled but not sorted, in, not sorted into cl and because I think boxes. Clustering is a question, is, 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 
Clustering versus non-clustered is sort of like interface bias. Well, uh, but it's emphasizing this norm of you ought to be exploring other things. There's a reason. There's a reason why you why you would do it if you were making a nudging interface. Okay. John and I have one last thing that I want to throw up as a question. I know I won't get to hear the answers. And the permutations. I mean, I, I would tend to think that just the two would be useful. Uh, but another factor is uh, my affiliation. So if I'm liberal and it goes liberal or conservative versus I'm liberal and it goes conservative or liberal, you'd have to account for that, I would think. Well, I can either randomize and, and then analyze afterwards, or I, could, or I could do something deliberate based on it. But I don't really have a strong theory about, well, I guess I do have a theory. I think if you're liberal, I want to put the liberal stuff first, because I think you'll be more open to seeing something conservative after you've looked at something liberal. But, but I, think, I think I want to try both ways and, right. and get evidence for that. And, and I had a general question about, I mean, this is news reading. This task, is there any uh, kind of attempt to how this task relates to, have they already read their news for the morning anyway? I mean, so have they kind of already gotten their take on this issue and then they're doing this totally, right. you know, what's the relationship of this task relative to that? So this could be, this is another external validity yeah. thing of, you know, if, if somebody's already read all this stuff about that story, then they're going to spend less time with it here. I think, that, I think that ends up being sort of having some people who are just less interested in the topic probably is, is, a, uh, you know, is, is a source of random error rather than bias for me. But good, also a good thing to think about. And Michael, can you I'll hold be it? Because I want to get my sure. last question up, and I know we're at, at 2 o'clock, which is? I spent a little time, a lot of time, with another former student, Daniel Joe, who, who finished his PhD and really wants to be an entrepreneur, trying to take some of our automated classification technologies and things to try to make a business, uh, sort of a social venture, uh, where we get people to have more diverse political exposure. And our first attempt in this space was, let's make a news aggregator or a recommender something that will get people the stuff that they want for those people who do want diverse exposure. And we actually found, we did, we did our, if any of you have sort of done your taking entrepreneurship classes, we, we went to the NSF i -Corps program and they made us go out and do customer discovery. And so we, we found there are people who would want that, but nobody who would want to pay for it. What we seemed to find that people wanted to pay for was to get other people to be more balanced. <laughs> <laughs> that works right. If you'll pay me, I'll read other stuff. Okay. So, so, we, uh, so that's the thing that we've been exploring now. And we thought that people would pay to get other people to do this. But actually, we, haven't, uh, we, we thought we had a clever way that we would get people to, to be willing to be the, uh, the recipient. But we actually didn't. We, we have not found organizations that want to pay to get people who don't already agree with them to be exposed to their message. No, they, they actually go for people who are predisposed to like the thing, but maybe aren't aware of it. And, and one individual spent, so I have my opposite viewpoint so friend like on doctor. Facebook, and then yeah. I want to pay, like get him, you know, reading this other stuff, right? Yeah, maybe they, you know? maybe we can go direct to individuals. That's, anyway. I mean I, I, I mean, I think if you're like an extremely liberal source, then maybe it's not worth it to advertise to like extremely conservative people. But if you can find the people that are sort of borderline and like nudge the border a little further, it seems like something that'd be very valuable. This is how political campaigns do it, right? Yeah. Well, they, the political campaigns are spending a lot of money to try to avoid reaching the opposition. Because it's a way, because they're spending a little bit of money to avoid wasting their effort on the people that they think they have no chance on. But yeah, they'd exactly. also like to avoid spending it on the people they absolutely know they're set. They right. really want to focus on creeping this border for yeah. them. Uh, well, actually, the political campaigns are, these days are very happy to reach the people who, are, who, who they know they're going to get to make sure that they actually go out and vote. So they, they put a lot of effort in to get out the vote. Yeah, they put some effort into people who are maybe, you know, leaning their way but, but haven't come yet. Yeah. So, <clears throat> efforts like these often benefit from starting with a market niche. And so, some people are information seeking. A lot of this liberal convert conservative stuff has more to do with entertainment than information. Mm -hmm. If you can, I 
find a way to identify people who are information seeking and find a way to give them choices of articles that are thoughtful rather than entertainment oriented or shouting heads kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, that's a plausible market. Finding them, giving them a useful product, that's the hard part. Yeah, I, so I think we could get it, make a useful product for them and, I, and we did sort of, we were doing our interviews, I found, I found somebody like that who was, uh, he was the campus minister for um, Presbyterian. He's very conservative, but very thoughtful. And, uh, and uh, you know, I asked him, to show, show me, how are you, what are you doing? He, he reads all kinds of liberal sources. And, uh, and I, you know, I say, well, you know, what if I could get you just the ones that were actually thoughtful? Because he was you know, complaining about the stuff that wasn't thoughtful. And he, he said, actually, I found them. <laughs> so the, I think the problem is the people who really want that feel like they've sort of already found what what they need now maybe maybe uh, you know I'm I'm over generalizing from not enough data and maybe there are people who who would pay for something like that maybe one final comment do you want to take the prerogative since I cut off your last question who had their hands up maybe was it someone who hasn't said something before any new voice gets the last comment Okay. Yes. Uh, so on your previous uh, one, there's another option, which is going from moderate to extremist, right? So essentially just kind of like kind of on, on the side um, in terms of the cluster ordering. Uh, but the question I wanted to ask was, back during the part where you had the orders and the highlighting, right, um, you had a result which was that if you put the things that you're most likely to agree with on the top, it's actually going to decrease the amount that you like the result, right? I think that was. Yeah. Why? Like, 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 that's kind of like counter to like what the search engines do, right? They put the things you want, and like they put on things you want, like, and they assume that they'll make you happier, right? So we're not sure. Uh, we have one speculation that it was an artifact of our, of where we put the question. The question was at the bottom, oh. right after you saw it. So if all the stuff you like was at the top, and then the stuff you don't <laughs> like is right after, and then we ask you the question, we think that might be why. And we don't we don't have any other good explanation for it. So, uh, th there are there are you know could be anything we don't know. But okay. well, thank we'll you.